Hi, I'm Tommy Moore from the Bar Tits Lab, and I feel I was a little bit remiss the other day because I did a post about women's self-protection and because I'm getting an increasing amount of queries, concerns and comments for people looking for help and support because they feel in the wake of things like the Sarah Everard case, people's feeling is they are more prolific than ever before, they're more at risk than ever before. And I put a post out there because I get a lot of people saying, could I learn some moves to keep myself safe? And, you know, I've got real strong opinion about the efficacy of just learning some moves. But I feel like what I put out there really was probably negative teaching. I was telling people what not to do and what not to think, and that's not really useful. So I thought I would try and provide something of use. Now, what I put out there that I have no particular skin in this game because I don't market myself as an instructor for women's self-defense. It's not what I'm into, it's not my bag. So I'm not looking to, to fill classes with any type of demographic not my interest area at all. But that does allow me, I think, to offer some more impartial advice. And impartiality in these things is also very, very important. And so I thought I'd lay some, some, some tips out there to get you thinking in the right way, or at least in my opinion, thinking in the right way. And hopefully these help you or you can share them with others and they might help people go on their journey if they wish to discuss and explore these things further because there are a lot of sharks out there in this ocean if you don't know what you're looking for. So I thought I'd break down. But when people say, teach me some moves, here are some moves you can learn without having to go to any Yoda, Sensei, Coach, Sigung, whoever. You don't need to go to anyone for that. But they are very, very useful. And with all this stuff, it's about risk mitigation. It's about how many notches down the risk ladder can I go? Not one singular item from the things I talk about, from the things you find elsewhere, will keep you 100% safe. But everything you do will add more percentage points for you keeping safe. So again, the more of these types of things you can do, the better. And I don't want to get into the debate of, should you? Should you do this? Uh, if I don't have control of the world, I'm not a morals teacher or an ethics teacher. Um, if you are a rapist watching this, stop fucking raping and go hang yourself. But you know, at the end of the day, I can only really provide you with some advice and some skills if you find yourself at the pointy end of this. There's not much societal change, particularly that, that I can do or that you know I feel I have in my control. But hopefully some of these tips will help keep you safe and add more percentage points in lieu of you wanting to go to places and learn some moves. So here is simple, you know, you would have heard many of these before, they're common sense, but do them. Don't just go, yeah, 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 it makes sense. Do it. So one, charge your bloody battery. Charge your battery on your phone. If you're going out, if you're going on the tube, your phone has so many things. It's the Swiss army knife of technology. It has a torch, it has a phone, it has maps, it has all sorts of really, really, really useful stuff for you to use and exploit. So make sure you do so. Make sure that your technology, and technology is your friend, is fully optimised for keeping yourself safe. So before you go out, make sure you are very charged. And if you've got an old phone that runs out of charge quickly, buy a new freaking phone. Buy a phone that has significant charge, significant battery, because maps help you if you get lost. You can phone friends, phone family, phone police. You can use that torch to navigate. Please, please, please just charge your damn phone or buy a phone that has sufficient battery to keep you safe. It's common sense. Secondly, within your phone, within your little magic wonder box, is the best, the best in secret military intelligence. And what that secret military intelligence is, it's maps and street view. So planning your routes, knowing how you're going to walk to a place or from a place. And if you feel or suspect there may be some risk in those places, or if you haven't been there before, or it's in a part of the world you've not been to before yet, use Street View. So don't just look at the maps and say, oh, it goes past a green block, a green block. It must be a lovely park. Make sure, OK, A, you've seen the most efficient route that avoids danger areas, you know, alleyways, shortcuts, avoid all that shit. You know this, you know this in your soul. But also just take the time to plonk the little street view man there because that green blob that looked pretty innocuous in maps view, when it's in street view mode, might look like some kind of scene from downtown Compton. It might look rough as arseholes. So make sure you use both the maps functionality and the street view functionality to build a good 360 picture of 
where you're going, how you're going to get there, what does it look like, are there enough shops, lights, cameras, is all the stuff there that you know helps you keep safer. So again, make sure maps and street view, a bit of route planning goes a long way. Just burn it into your mind your way. Don't rely on always having to follow the maps on your phone. Because A, whilst I said charge your battery, sometimes they go out. B, if you're walking through a slightly suspect area, you shouldn't be anyway, but let's say you are, you don't want to be going there with your thousand pound phone, looking at maps, holding it out all the time in front of your face. So a bit of route planning, a bit of forward planning, a bit of FP is a very wise thing to do. But street view and maps, that is very, 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 very important. Thirdly, keep people informed as to where you're going and when you're likely to be back. This just makes a lot of sense. So if you plan to be back by 12, let people know. Put yourself a little bit of a threshold if you want. Say, I'll be back by one-ish. Letting people know ish when you're going to be back is really useful. And I know people feel like they shouldn't have to do it, but it's really, really useful because it gives people a bit of a hot lead. If you were due back by one, and you've not been seen by four, it gives people some reason within a useful time window to come looking or come thinking about you. So again, make sure that you let people know where you're going and what you're doing, if you can. Also, I'd really recommend something called the ICE app. Now, the ICE app allows you to uh, preload messages for certain times. So, for example, you might go out, plan to be back by 12, you might preload a message to your mum by nine the next day saying if i've not messaged you by now could you please check where i am this is where i've been going this is what i've been doing uh, you know so you can preload messages to people you know people you trust and they can go out at strategic timing so if you haven't heard from me by x it will automatically send that message you don't need your phone doesn't need to be on to send that message it is automatically gone so using things like the ice app give it a look give it a try it's really 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 useful dress functionally so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this because this one tends to get people a little bit triggered. But for me, it's not about form. Dress however you want. Completely cool. But I would say this. If you're really, 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 really that worried about staying safe, you need to give yourself a little bit of a SWOT analysis. So can I run in this and can I fight in this if I had to? So if you're wearing impractical shoes, impractical trousers, an impractical skirt, an impractical top, and you are very worried about assault and being attacked, you need to balance your own risk ratio. I'm not saying that certain things trigger certain people because there are cunts that will attack you if you go out there dressed in bin bags. So I don't really give a fuck about that. What I do care about is if you need to leg it, can you leg it? Now, an easy hack for this type of stuff, because this is, the, this is the advice that tends to get people a bit triggered, would be having things like roll-up pumps or roll-up trainers in a bag. That was quite a big one, but you can get very small, very thin, very discreet pumps that you can feasibly run in and walk in comfortably. Not only do they make sense, because you don't want to be standing in a kebab queue for hours in, in heels or shoes that, that are tight and that hurt, so that's important. But it also allows you if you're going to or from a place, especially from a place. So if you're going at two in the morning, you need to catch that bus or that tube or that Uber, whatever. Having those little rolled up pumps might make you feel more comfortable, might make you move there faster, which means you're less likely to miss that train, miss that tube, miss that Uber. It allows you to run if you need to and fight if you need to. So things like practical shoes uh, make a lot of sense. And a lot of people know this already, but those little roll up ones are a really good solution. And it's not gender based, this advice, too, because I've got a lot of young lads that, that, that come and train with me and they're always in stupid skinny jeans, in stupid trainers that, that the laces aren't tied up at all and in very, very, very tight shirts, which they can't fucking fight in either. So my advice is ubiquitous and universal. If you can't run and you can't fight, then you're probably and you know this already in the, those items of clothing you probably need to look at how much you want to look good compared to how much you wish to keep safe and make your own informed, wise decision about that. Other things. Learn to be rude if you have to. A lot of assaults, especially a lot of assaults on women, come from people not wanting to offend or upset any other person. And to be honest, unless you're interested in making friends with that stranger who you'll probably never see again, 
you need to abandon the notion of, of, of being rude, of, of saying no. You need to get used to being firm and assertive and clear. And upsetting people aren't very, very, if people don't know you, they can't be that upset. Someone tries their luck and you say no very, very clearly. Once you've put that out there and that official no has landed, anything after that gives you some very good reasons to be concerned or alarmed. So if you start clear, you at least know where you stand. So abandon the notion of feeling rude or dismissive to people. It's very, very important that you look after number one and you keep yourself safe. Unless you're invested in building a relationship with that person, be as rude as you bloody well please. And ignore advice that says that may trigger a reaction from someone if, if you're a little bit curt, if you're a little bit to the point. And I'd say that's bollocks. Uh, if you are straight to the point and clear and fair and concise with what you're saying and people then have an aggressive response to it odds are they were always going to have an aggressive response to a stimuli so if anything you've just saved yourself 30 minutes of finding out if he's a dickhead or not so being clear being concise being firm not worrying about being rude it really does not matter and if it does trigger something that thing would have always been triggered regardless Illumination matters. Please, 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 if you can, if you've got the ability, if you've got keys, have some secondary form of illumination. Having your phone out for a torch, A, it drains the battery very quickly. And battery is very important for the other better uses of the phone. But if you have to, use your phone, use your phone. But if you can, take a small torch or a pencil torch. It doesn't matter about brands, you can read brands for the rest of your life about different sizes and voltages and lumens and all that shit. Um, but buy yourself a reasonably good, probably £10 plus torch that is small enough that fits your lifestyle. This, you know, this is at the bigger end of small, but you can get very thin, still powerful pencil torches that you can have on you, give you a secondary form of illumination that don't advertise to everyone that you've got a phone. So again, if you're going through a suspect area and all you need is light, it's much better to have a torch and move your way through if possible. So it's a useful tool to have and you can get them very thin and very discreet, not much larger than a cigarette and they can still do the job. And again, it's just not advertising in dodgy areas. Hey, hey everybody, look at me, I got a phone. Because very often one type of criminality can lead to another. What might start as a theft might end in a rape or a murder. So if you avoid being bait for the theft, the other steps are naturally negated. So again, investing at some illumination that doesn't take battery or advertise the fact you've got an expensive phone. Very, very, very simple. Uh, you can use them as defensive objects if you wish, but that's a physical skill set and I'm not focusing on that right now. Knowing how to make a scene. Things like this have fallen rapidly out of fashion. Oh, fucking hell. But in reality, they are small, they're discreet, they cause a lot of a noise. They cause a lot of hubbub. Many of them also have little torches on them, which is again, a third, a tertiary level of illumination. How wonderful is that? They're very, very useful to have. Um, I get a bit upset because there are a lot of people say, oh, people won't come or people only come if there's a fire. People don't investigate loud noises. It draws attention. It builds fear. You know, it causes kerfuffle. Criminals do not want kerfuffle. They want silence, compliance, an easier success. So, you know, a lot of people have been talked out of things like this. I don't feel like I should carry one. I don't feel like I have to carry one, blah, 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 blah. But it's a useful tool, these personal alarms. Again, the more expensive you go, the better. You shouldn't be spending more than £10 on these anyway. Um, but don't buy a very, very cheap wish one that's going to run out of battery and cost you 30 pence. You know, buy a relatively decent one. Make sure you've got a set on your car keys and you take one with you. They are very, very useful tools. Again, it's all about those percentage points in that, yes, this cannot keep you safe, but it might make you 6% safer. Add the torch, you may now be 30% safer. Have the charged phone, you may be 40% safer. Tell people where you're going, you now might be 50% safer. Everything adds those percentage points. It's a cumulative game, staying safe for everybody. So rape alarms, personal alarms, whatever you want to call it, they're useful for drawing attention, making noise, building fear. They'll deter the lower to medium level opportunists. It's good to have in your arsenal and available. But with all these things, especially thing like this, 
You know, it's something that you should have out with you when you're walking. When you're walking home, you shouldn't have to fumble for it. If you've got your source of illumination and you've got your source of noise making, these are good things to have pre in your hands. In your hands, available to users. Defensive objects if you need to. More importantly, just so you can rip it and make a noise. Um, and ideally, keep this near you, on you, in a pocket, in in your bra, wherever the fuck you've got it. But if you throw this down, you might be moved somewhere else where that's less effective. So if you can keep the noise making bit on you for as long as possible while still being able to fight back, it's a very useful thing to have. Being aware. Now there's two points to being aware. There is being aware and there is looking aware. And, and those are two important parts of the same coin. So being aware, this is, oh, this is a huge topic in itself. But, you know, it's about looking where you're walking, knowing where you're walking, looking at people, making a risk profile. What type, you know, is that group in the right place? Is that a bit of a dodgy looking group? You know, those guys hanging outside of McDonald's, are they likely to cause me problems? You know, being entirely aware of your surroundings and the people in them. It's a no brainer, really, but you can spend a lot of time looking at that and practicing that mindfully. Act, you know, in your mind, just ticking things off on a list. Dodgy group there in your mind. Oh, I can't really see around that corner. If you repeat these things to yourself, it's a very, very useful tool. So those kind of that mental tech list of I've seen that, I've seen that, I'm aware of that. It's a really good exercise to have for your brain and keeps you switched on, keeps you on a swivel. You're walking home, you've got fuck all to do anyway. Do this stuff and make sure that you don't block your senses. Getting wankered off your tits, getting really drunk, that's gonna block a lot of senses. But even if you're not, if you're listening to headphones, if you wanna to listen to music, you know, I listen to music when I walk. So I'm not gonna to preach to you about walking home like you're a member of SEAL Team 6, but at least maybe take one earphone out. So you've got some degree of, of auditory perception. You know, being able to hear stuff, often when it's dark, your ears and your nose are now the go-to tools. So, so make sure you can hear. Best case, take both out, be aware, if you feel very at risk. If you feel any somewhat at risk, at least take the one out. Try and reduce the amount of things blocking your senses, is all I'm saying. The other area of awareness is projecting your awareness, and that really matters too. And what I mean by that, it's a bit like doing your driving test. There's the act of looking at your mirrors, but when you're on your driving test, you are looking at your mirrors because you want people to see you are looking at your mirrors. It's the same when you're projecting awareness, being visibly aware or vis visibly obvious at distance that this person is looking, not just scanning, but looking around. If you look like you are looking, you are suddenly a less appetizing, appetizing target. You really are. If you look away, if you look on a swivel, and that means some degree of exaggeration. Yes, I can see to my left-hand side with a little bit of side eye, but I can also bloody turn my head. And turning my head means that someone that's 20, 30 meters away knows I'm looking. They might not know I'm looking if I just move my eye, but they know I'm fucking looking if I move my head. So projecting that awareness, looking like an aware person and being an aware person, these are two parts of awareness that are very, very, very important. I hope that makes sense. Looking and being overtly aware and being aware at the same time. They're two useful streams of the same thing. Being physically capable. This is an awkward one, but you're just going to have to fucking suck it up. Can you sprint for 30 seconds? Can you punch, hit, gouge, fight a thing for 15 seconds full on? These are the two parameters by which I would judge effective self-defense fitness. And obviously the better and more fitter you are, that's fantastic, wonderful, do it. Be as fit and as strong and as healthy and as full of endurance as you possibly can be as a human being. But your minimum viable product is, can I leg it for 30 seconds? Because it may be a 30 second sprint, all out fucking sprint to the nearest shop, light source, respectable human being out there. If you can do it for a minute, even better. But you need to have a solid Usain Bolt level, drop of a hat, big fuck off sprint. You need to be able to do that. Or at least aspire to be able to do that, work at that. 
And you need to be able to fight like a cat in a bath for 15 seconds. Full on hitting, gouging, biting, pulling, like, like the world depends on it. Okay, you need to be able to do that concertedly as an explosion of violence for at least 15 seconds. Odds are you won't need anything like that number, but I'd say as an endurance benchmark or something to work to, can I be explosively violent and powerful and fast and vicious and targeted within a 15 second window? It's an important skill to have. Check. Uh, the sad truth of it is you're far more likely to be attacked by someone you know or uh, an acquaintance or a friend of a friend or a family friend or something like that than any other fictionalised boogeyman that may jump out at you. The reason why the, the boogeymen get such great news is because they're so abundantly rare. But abusive brothers, uncles, fathers, friends, friends of friends, university lecturers, whatever, they're a dime a dozen, so they don't really make the news. But do bear in mind that they are the far more common threat to you. So, there are a couple of things. If you're in the UK, you can make use of something called Claire's Law. And, and Claire's Law is thus that if you suspect that your partner may be abusive or violent or have a history of that kind of stuff, um, especially when it comes towards women, then your local police can check it out. So if you ask about Claire's Law with your local police, so don't call 999 unless you're in a proper, proper emergency, call your local police, um, talk to them about Claire's Law, say you've got con some concerns, and there'll be a short interview, a questionnaire. You will have to sign up to keep it secret um, that you are running this check on a person. It's completely anonymous. The person will not know they're being checked. So the only way they'll find out is if you open your mouth, so keep your mouth shut. Um, you know, don't, re don't spread the word because it can be very damaging to people. Sometimes people are just pricks, but they're not abusive or violent pricks. So I'd say if you're gonna use Claire's Law, I understand you've got worries and concerns, but do be respectful of the other person that could just be a shitty boyfriend. Not an abusive boyfriend, just a shitty boyfriend. So, Claire's Law. Contact your local police, talk to them about Claire's Law. They will run a background check on that person and tell you if there's any previous convictions or cautions or anything like that you need to be concerned about. And then you can make an informed decision. Bear in mind that there's a first time for everything. So, just because you've heard nothing back, it might be that the previous partners have been too scared, Afraid, bullied, coerced, the other, the, not being caught, whatever. So if you've got proper suspicions, still absolutely act on them. But by the same token, Claire's Law is an easy way to weed out people that you've got worries about. And this could be for, you know, a partner, a co-worker, what have you. Do use it and tell other people about it. It's very, very useful. Other things you want to think about is learning the rituals of violence. Now, the rituals of violence, these are charm and deception you know so people being too charming too kind too nice too out there with their gifts and their wealth and their flattery and their flirtation you know their deception they may lie to you and they'll lie to you in any number of ways you've also got to learn about things such as the dangers of, so so one of the rituals for example is secondary locations and for us in combatives we think of secondary locations as like in the IRA come in balaclavas and duct tape you and chuck you in the back of a transit van. And yes, if you go to a secondary location, odds are you are destination fucked. But an important part of that is understanding that the secondary location could just be you coming in for a coffee, nipping back for a pizza, or, uh, you know, you join me, we're having a house party. That house party, that pizza, that coffee could be a dangerous secondary location without me having to dump you in the back of a transit. So being taken to another place can often have danger. So you wanna be very careful when you move from a public place to a private or a secluded or any other place. You know, you might be physically moved there, you may be bound, dragged, pulled, pushed, threatened, whatever. But know that if you go to that secondary place, wherever that place is, it could be a corner of the park or in a completely another city or another town, if you get moved to that second place or move to that secondary place, your chances of survival go from here to here. So be aware of secondary locations and be aware that they don't always mean being dragged into a van at knife point. Sometimes that can be achieved through charm. Just come back with me. We're having a, we're having a Papa John's pizza. Come on, just join me. Go on. That might be just as dangerous as get in the van. Hopefully that makes sense. When you move to an unfamiliar place or are moved, to an unfamiliar place, your risk profile goes up. 
and you've got to be able to learn to manage conversations. If it does start with a physical assault, then you will need physical skills. So often, things may start with a verbal probing or an inquiry or what some people in the combatives industry call the interview. And that's where people talk with you and discuss with you and charm you and flirt with you or somewhat threaten you just to gauge what kind of human you are. So you need to understand conversation craft and you need to be able to have ways to manage awkward conversations. For example, how you deal with a persistently aggressive drunk homeless guy might be different for how you deal with a persistently flirtatious and slightly creepy co-worker. And you need to be able to move your way through lots of different realistic archetypes of conversation that could occur. From the, I'm just trying to be helpful guy, to the very obviously rapey guy, to the smells of piss guy. You know, there's lots of different types of people out there and the different types of conversations you may have. You know, it might be a person persistently asking for change or to use their phone, or it may be someone that is very, very complimentary. And you need to practice these conversations. So if you can, make sure you do practice those conversations or think about what your answers can be. A lot of people find themselves in stunned silence or find themselves trapped in a conversation loop because they don't know how to manage the conversation. So if you can work with people to replicate and role play and scenario, some of the typically occurring scenarios where talking could lead to something worse. And you need to know how to talk your way through it, talk your way out of it. And there are a couple of different things that you might need. So you might need to be able to de-escalate. Can I take an angry or an aggressive person and bring them down? Can I take a obnoxious or persistent person and can I deter them? Can I be firm and concise and clear? And can I deter them? So can I defuse you? Can I de-escalate? Can I calm you down? Or can I rebuff you? Can I be a solid wall of no? And both of those have pros and cons for different scenarios and you need to be able to do that. You may also use things like humour and wit and other bits and pieces like that. But at the very least, you need to know how to be clear and communicate clearly and to bring people down from levels of violence inch by inch. These are two very important skills to have and they will flex depending on the scenarios in which you need to use them. And then, if all of that fails, if your awareness, if your projected awareness fails, if your technology fails, so your, your phone, your maps, if your forward planning fails, your, your route mapping, your street view, you know, if your alarms fails and your lights fail and every other system goes against you and you find yourself physically attacked, then you need those skills. It's very important that all of the things I've talked about in this very long-winded video, and I apologise it's long-winded, but I also don't apologise that it's a long-winded, because if you've got bored and switched off and just gone to a two-minute YouTube version, then you've probably got the sprinkles on the cake and you've forgotten the cake. So if you've watched this far, well done you, because you've invested some time in learning some stuff. But only if all of those things fail you, would you really need to rely on those physical skills. Um, and this is where people say, Tommy, teach me some moves. Or tell me where a guy is who can teach me some moves. You know, all of the moves I just talked about, from having proper fucking shoes to a charged up phone, carry a battery pack. You know, your self-defense might be having a phone and having a charger pack with you. So you've got more phone. So you can use your Swiss Army knife of technology to stay fucking safe. You know, this might be to the approximate value of 30 Krav Maga sessions. Extra charger for your phone. Save yourself. <laughs> yeah, this might be a useful tool to have. But if it does need to go physical, people ask my advice, what should I do? And there's this club near me, and this club near me, and this club near me, and this club near me. And this is always hard because I've trained with some very good traditional martial arts people, and I've trained with some very poor combatives people, and I've trained with some very good combatives people, and I've trained with some very poor traditional martial arts people. So it's all flux, it's all chaos, it's all madness. So I can't really, unless I individually know the instructor, I can't really give blanket answers because it's so varied. But if you have to push me for an answer, um, then my personal advice would be, if you have the time, to commit to it, 
my personal advice would be to find yourself a concerted combat sport. And that combat sport could be something like judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, and things of that ilk. Yeah, things where people regularly meet up and push, pull, hit, and grab each other. That there are people there that are fit, that are strong, that are skilled. And if you can go to a place like that, you will develop tried and tested skills that you believe in. That if I know I can, as a small 10 stone woman, break the arm of that 18 stone man, knowing that is power. Whether you can pull it off on the street or not, I don't, that bit is up to the gods. Your luck, your skill, your size, where you drunk, where you're not, so many variables. But that knowledge that you can and that you have, and you know it, and you know it, and you've done it while they're resisting and they're properly resisting, that is power. So for me, I would advise get yourself, if you can, to a combat sport where you are tried and you are tested and it's under fire and under pressure. And then once you've got those skills, add ancillary tools to that from the combatives world. And I use a word like that, but if you're sending this to some 18 year old that's not into martial arts, they'll be like, what the the fuck's combatives? So get yourself to something like a Krav Maga, or if you search the word combatives or reality-based self-defense, you'll find things that talk about pretty much the same thing. There are pros and cons to the physical things that those classes do. But what they will do is get you to think about things the sports stuff doesn't really do, such as multiple opponents, weapons, psychology, self-defense and the law. These are all useful things, very useful things. But for me personally, my advice would be, as a human that's only got a certain amount of time to spend, spend the time investing in the hard combat sports skills, robustness, testing, psychology, strength. All of these things will work in your favour no matter what happens. And then sprinkle on top of that numbers, the law, weapons, stuff like that. Improvised weapons are amazing, especially if you find yourself at a physical disadvantage. Being able to take a pen, whop it in an eye and leg it, fantastic. But if you can't jab a man's eye with your fist, ain't no way in hell you're going to be able to stab it with a pen. If you can't hit something that doesn't want to be hit, you'll never be able to do it properly. And whilst there are clubs that there are combat sports clubs that talk about self defensey stuff, and there are self defensey clubs that do combat sportsy type drills and pressure, my personal advice for, for, for maximum likelihood of you getting it right would be the combat sports with the sprinkling of the self defense, combatives, and self protection. That would be my own personal, but it will come with biases because that's my bias and that's my background. But hand on heart, if I was giving this advice to a relative, which I do very often, that would be my advice. My own flesh and blood, that's my advice. Robust combat sports with a sprinkling of combative self defense know how. This for me is, is, is a really good algorithm for success. Um, but it's 100% graft and it's no tricks. And if you want to stay safe, you got to do it. The reason why people drive pretty much all day with, without dying most of the time, you know, road accidents happen, but most people drive for most of their lives with very little incident indeed. It's because they drive every day and they get very good at driving. They don't need to think about driving. They don't need to worry about driving. They just drive. Everything you do, the more you do it, the more natural it will be. So don't just do a six week course or an eight week course. If you're going to do it, do it. Do it properly. Do it for the distance. Take the time to invest in yourself. So if you are genuinely worried, if you're worried enough, then you'll do it for years. If you're only worried because you read that article and you're a little bit, then you'll do it for a couple of weeks and you'll get bored and you'll leave. If you're going to get bored and you'll leave, just do the stuff I talked about earlier in the video. Charge your phone, good shoes, download ICE, use Claire's Law. Those things will keep you very, very safe most of the time. But if you are going to invest in the physical stills, invest properly, invest wisely, and do it well. And there are lots and lots of people that will help support you in there. But make sure, if you can, go to an impartial person, someone that doesn't have skin in the game, that someone that isn't militantly pro this art or anti this art. 
go to people with balanced opinions if you can. There's a lot of stupid stuff on the internet. There's a lot of stupid stuff on YouTube. Try and speak to a real human that's got a reasonable attitude and you'll get good advice about what types of clubs and what type of things are near and around you. But that would be that would be my advice to you. So when people say, teach me some moves, or if anyone says to you, teach me some moves, I hope that you can talk to them about some of the things I mentioned in this video, or send them this video. And once they've got that and they've learnt those good habits, then if they still wish, then they can go ahead and build those physical skills. But if you do the first bit right, you're less and less likely to need those physical skills. And do rest assured that if you're watching this in a first world country, and you probably are, then there's an overwhelming probability that you are safe and you will continue to be safe. And it's very, very unlikely that very bad things may happen to you. That's not to say it isn't important to learn these skills. I am passionate about these skills. But I would say don't be unduly worried or alarmed or feel pressured to learn stuff that you don't really want to learn. So go into this with an open heart and an open mind. If you really want to learn this, if you are serious about keeping yourself safe, then approach the subject seriously and apply the things I've talked about and speak to others about it earnestly. That would be my advice to you. So instead of learning some moves, use this, use this, and you'll keep safe nine times out of ten. But good luck to you, wherever you are, and I hope you don't feel too worried, and I hope this has given you a little bit of knowledge to keep yourself a little bit safer. Cheers.